All right, any questions at all about last time we talked about law and order? Let me see here. Uh, the, the main thought really was when do we get to disobey the government or when are we not obligated to obey the government might be a better way to think of it, not when we get to. Um, can anybody summarize that in just a, a little simple statement? I won't say simple sentence, but when are we not obligated to obey the government? When you can't obey the Bible and the government. Yes, when the two are directly at odds with each other. If there's a way to figure out to do both, then you really should do both. And we looked at some examples and saw people put in positions where they could not do both. And at that point, we have to obey God. We talked about, uh, we looked at some passages, looked at some things to learn about it, looked at some points to remember, and then wrapped it up with civil disobedience and really how that's an ungodly philosophy. Even um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, tried to argue that he was... Uh, acting just like the martyrs in Rome and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and other places, and that, that is not the case at all. So, and then the very, very last thought was, because we are supposed to obey the government, it should cause us to be concerned and be involved. Right? Uh, we are obligated to obey it. It would be much easier, at least from my perspective, to avoid having the law that's going to put us at odds with the government ever becoming law. <laughs> it would be nicer to stop it beforehand and not have to deal with it. So we are obligated to obey. And so we don't, we, especially in a, in a country where we, we have the freedom and the opportunity to participate, it should cause us to even more. All right, war theory, today's topic. Now, usually all the guys get excited. This is not as uh, thrilling as you think it is. Um, we're not gonna talk about tactics or tell war stories the whole time. So. All right, there's two main things we want to do today. One is um, look at what the Bible teaches about war, when it's right to go to war, and what conditions is it justified or not justified. And then want to look at, at the traditional philosophical war theory, you know, going back, you know, the philosophers from the Middle Ages and on back, just traditionally what have... Uh, what is involved in theories of war and when it's right to go to war and how to prosecute the war and that type of thing. Um, so kind of two separate things, not that the, the war theories is, goes contrary to the Bible completely, but it are, we're going to look at the Bible and get an idea from the Bible. We can get, I think, a, a, a pretty simple thought from the Bible about when it's right to go to war, and then we'll look at the philosophers and they, they, they have to add extra things there to make us think about it. So it's not necessarily bad, but a little bit different. All right, uh, Bible, what does it say about war? I'm going to look, look at several passages here. <clears throat> I've got two main things to look at. The first is that the Bible doesn't teach pacifism. All right, being a pacifist is not scriptural. Let me look at a couple of passages with you. Matthew 5. Uh, 38 and on. No, let's see, not 38. 44. This is Jesus speaking. We re actually referenced this passage already. This is Matthew 5, 35, 44. Jesus speaking, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So we have her that we're supposed to love our enemies, right? And so how, how can we go to war? if we're supposed to love our enemies. Um, we also have another passage. I, I'm sorry, I should back. These are passages sometimes people look to and say, oh, look, how can we go to war? Jesus made these statements or these, these things. Um, but they, they don't justify that, but I wanted to point them out up front. Luke chapter 3, verse 14. <clears throat> This is John the Baptist speaking. <coughs> and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? Okay, here we have soldiers. And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely. Do violence to no man. It would be kind of difficult, if you take the improper view of this, to continue to be a soldier. Because, you know, kind of the basic job of a soldier is to do violence to men. <laughs> that's, that's a very bedrock of it. Do violence to no man. All right. 
if we keep reading, he never tells him to quit being a soldier. So he can't, that can't be what he's saying. It says, neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. Was he asking them to defraud the Roman government, continue to get paid as a soldier, but when it come time, comes time to actually fight, refuse? During um, Desert Storm, were you guys alive for that? Were you little kids? Okay. You're almost alive? <laughs> Uh, and I just remember hearing stories of soldiers that were married with children. Both, both were in the army or something. And all of a sudden, when it, when it was time for war, when they had to go fight, they said, oh, we can't both go. We have children. <laughs> they, they took the money all the way along. <laughs> and they took all the benefits. Right? But when it was time to actually go fight, all of a sudden, oh, this isn't fair. How could you expect us to fight? They didn't offer to give back all the money. If they'd offer that, then I, I couldn't live with it. But anyway, was Paul, or, uh, John here asking them to somehow defraud the government? And the answer is no. He's not telling them here to don't be a soldier. He tells them to, to continue getting your wages. So sometimes people look at passages like that and come up with the idea that uh, the Bible teaches pacifism. There's even a famous old movie about a pacifist who goes to war. Anybody know that one? Not that it's especially scriptural or anything, but he, he claims in the, in the movie it was a religious thing with him. Wasn't it? Uh, World War I. Yeah, Sergeant York. Sergeant York. Anybody seen Sergeant York? At the beginning, he's struggling with this idea of going to war. When he does go to war, he does a very good job at it, but it was, uh, he had this religious problem with going to war and thought it was based on the Bible. And it really, the Bible does not teach that. Okay, so sometimes people look at passages like that and say, oh, look, God is teaching pacifism. We can't possibly go to war. Can anybody... Th- Yes. What was the Matthew one? Matthew five forty four was the actual verse. The whole passage there is connected, but forty four. Can anybody think of anything in the Bible that would uh, undermine this idea of the the Bible teaching pacifism or support that it, it doesn't teach pacifism? Like the entirety of the Old Testament. <laughs> okay, the entirety of the Old Testament. Think of all the times that God told them to go to war. Right. Jesus told his disciples to make sure they have a sword. Yes. If you don't have a sword, sell your coat and go buy one. Okay, so anything else? The entirety of the Old Testament, that wraps up a lot of ground. <laughs> okay, those two are very, very good. Um, think of the centurion that had a vision from God and was told to go get Paul and bring him over to him. In Acts, it'd be Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Maybe we should look there, rather than try to remember. <clears throat> so here we have a soldier. If, if God was really adamant against war and was a pacifist and taught us to be pacifist, think about what he tells this man. Uh, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italians, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw a vision in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Thy prayer and thy arms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose sur- I'm sorry, I said Paul, whose surname is Peter. He lodges there with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. All right, so we have this vision directly from God, and nowhere in it, is it addressed that this guy is involved in this evil profession of being a soldier and prosecuting war? It's not there. All right? You'd think if, that, if this was something God was dead set against, he would have been told to give up this uh, evil profession. But that, that didn't happen. Um, let's look at Matthew 8. We see another soldier that comes to Jesus here. Uh, verse 5, Matthew 8, 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth, I should back up, a centurion, a soldier, uh, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Um, Drop down to verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, so not, no, not in Israel. 
Okay, so you have the centurion that comes to Jesus and Jesus commends him for his faith. Doesn't ever instruct him to get out of his evil profession. If he involved in something sinful, Jesus would have addressed it, and he did not. All right, so God is not a pacifist, doesn't teach us to be a pacifist. So uh, how many of these do we want to look at? The centurions. Uh, what about the passage in Luke 3 that we looked at where it tells them to do violence to no man? Can we think what that's really getting at? John tells the, the, the soldiers to do violence to no man, be content with your wages, etc. Maybe while well, he's saying content with your wages, maybe they were like casual violence, like I'm a soldier, I have a weapon, you're a civilian, give me your money. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> Don't abuse your position. Right? You're going through a town, there's a bunch of Jews there, and you know the Romans hate the Jews, so uh, you, you, uh, you go through and uh, use, use your position of authority and the weapons you have to steal from them, to kill them, to do violence to them, etc. Don't do that on your own, just like any of us shouldn't do that on our own. That's what he's getting at, not to quit being a soldier. All right, so... That's a, the Bible doesn't teach pacifism. I really don't, I didn't expect any of you in here to be these uh, peace-loving peaceniks or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's that? Coexist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need to change that symbol. Somehow get the Christian symbols out of it because they don't want, it's everything but Christianity that would coexist. So. All right, next thing. What does the Bible actually teach? What, what about, it's not, it doesn't teach pacifism, so it must at some point allow war, and uh, we can uh, think about that. All right, let's first of all think about the basic job of the government. There's two passages that are well known for addressing this, and we've talked about them before. Romans 13, 13 3 and 4, and then 1 Peter Two. Does anybody remember the, the two basic jobs of the government? Let me go the other direction. Sarah? Good. <laughs> Glad you got that fixed. <laughs> we, we're describing the current government in America. <laughs> Reward evil and punish the good. All right, so reward the good, provide a system where the good can prosper and punish evil. Um, 2 Peter 2, 14 um, says, Or unto governors uh, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So the governor is there to punish evildoers. We, and I don't think unfairly or improperly, think of that primarily as law enforcement. You know, the, they're there to make sure um, some crooked businessman doesn't defraud you, some guy doesn't walk into your house and hit you in the head with a club and take all of your stuff. Um, we mostly, we, we naturally, I think, go to law enforcement. But that also would apply to people outside the country that wish to do evil to us. Okay? If we have another country or another large group of people outside the country that wants to do evil to us, that usually is addressed by the government with a war. <laughs> law enforcement doesn't make any sense it, it usually ends up being what we think of as a war. So that, that idea of restraining evil, punishing evil, that would apply also to, uh, to ISIS or uh, Hitler and Germany or Pol Pot, any, any outside forces that are wanting to do evil to us. The government's job is to stop that. Right? So here we have in, the, in the, the two basic jobs of the government, this idea of the, the government has at least a, this idea of stopping evil to its citizens, the, the authority to prosecute war. All right, um, the next point. So I have that as the, the basic job of the government. The next point, let me give you just a summary, and then we can think about it, um, uh, of what does the Bible teach. And this is, this is my personal summary, so maybe it's not too good, but I think I like it. Uh, a war is justified when it is killing and not murder. So we have that the government is authorized to prosecute this war. You know, it's at some, some point it's there to stop evil. And that action becomes justified when it is killing and not murder. Um, I've got a bunch of examples here written down and, and cases in the Old Testament where you were authorized to kill somebody in certain circumstances. We don't have to go down through all those. But really, for the, for the same basic reasons that I would be justified in killing somebody, our country is justified for going to war. 
Okay? If, um, if somebody's trying to kill me, I'm perfectly within my rights biblically <laughs> and in our country now legally uh, to defend myself and kill that person. The same thing would apply if we have a large group of people outside the country that are wanting to come and kill a large group of people inside the country. All right, the, 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 the things that would allow me to kill somebody morally and legally would extend to the country. So that's what I mean by it's justified when it's killing and not murder. Okay, and we can look in the Old Testament at their law and get uh, some ideas of the types of things that they were allowed to kill people for personally, and that would then extend on into the, the national realm. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, can anybody think of some things in the Old Testament that you were allowed to kill for? Allowed to kill for? <laughs> it was justified to defend yourself for. Oh. Not so much thinking about um, heresy or... No, that I, I was thinking, uh, the, what is that called? The, uh, when like, your family members killed other loved ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I mean that... Uh, you may, but the way you phrased the last part of the yeah. question. Yeah, you would be justified. That, that really is, it makes the, the whole legal system very... If you think about the fact that you <laughs> are the guy responsible to make sure he gets killed, whoever murdered your relative, and you're personally expected to do it, <laughs> that does change a little bit. Um, but yes, that's one. I mean, if we have, if, uh, if we have another country attack us and, uh, and murder a bunch of our citizens then we are perfectly biblically within our rights to, to respond and, and uh, try to defend ourselves against them and at least stop it from happening more. Right? There's not a court to go to, you know, unless you believe in the UN court. Um, there's not a court to go to. Um, but yeah, that would be perfectly fine. Some other country murders our citizens. That is scriptural grounds to then uh, go after that other country. At the very least, the people involved and, and prevent that country from doing it again. So that would be one. Um, the, uh, the Old Testament law talks about if somebody's stealing from you and you catch them in the act. Anybody remember that one? You, you can kill them. Right? You can't the next day chase them down and find them and, and shoot them and kill them. <laughs> but if you catch them in the act, you can kill them. So, so the, the Old Testament allows for even damages to, private, or to property. Uh, it can be a justified cause for killing somebody. I knew a guy... I knew a guy in Gary. <laughs> I picked up his cousin. <laughs> or I know it'd be his cousin. It'd be his, it'd be his nephew. And, anyway, they were related. Uh, but this guy got shot and killed trying to steal somebody's car in Gary. In the middle of the night, um, he was trying to break into a, a car in Gary. If you're, if you're in Gary, it's up on 3rd Street... Grant Street and third up and up in that area north of the South Shore lines. And the guy came to the house and shot and killed him. <coughs> <laughs> the cops came and investigated. They didn't even take the guy in for questioning, the guy that shot and killed him. I mean, he was breaking into his car. You know, so. And biblically, that guy is completely justified. So Now, if the guy who had his car stolen the next day saw the guy driving his car down the street and, you know, got in another car and chases him down and, and you know, and executes him or something, that isn't justified. <laughs> but biblically... Uh, if he's in the act and you catch him and end up killing him, perfectly, perfectly legal so, and moral, if to, the, to more to our point. So. All right, so for the things that would make it legal or at least immoral for me to kill somebody else, our country then uh, would be moral to kill somebody else. So. Okay, so when it's killing and not murder, in one sense it seems like an oversimplification, but to me that, that, that makes it a whole lot more simple. Right? You know, the things that you guys would be morally right to kill somebody for, the country then can respond. Uh, Pearl Harbor, that, that type of, you know, that, on the Japanese side, that was just mass murder. There's no justification. Our response was completely justified. Okay? Even all the way to dropping the atomic bombs. All right, that was completely justified. Emily's writing a paper about the Manhattan Project. And I forget the... Uh, I forget the numbers, but it's estimated that if we had to continue fighting the war, it would take like two or three days of actually invading Japan to have as many casualties as there were when we dropped the atomic bombs. And if you think of that, that type of death for, for three or four months to conquer Japan, it, it saved lots of lives. But you know, that's, that's, that's beside the point, saving lives. Perfectly justified. Um, uh, 
questions? Seems like there should be some more juicy stories to look at in the Bible, but I think that covers it. Should I turn the page? Yes, please, Mary Stan. Enough of this killing people. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, the next part of this is straight philosophical, f- straight, um, you know, traditional Western culture war theory. When it's right to go to war, how do you prosecute the war? That that I am not trying to say that this is completely contrary to the Bible. I'm not saying that at all. But I do want to make sure that. I'm not arguing or trying to portray this as being the biblical position, just trying to, just the kind of the dominant position in Western culture historically has been. Now, the, this, uh, this war theory is split up into two pieces. And just to make it fun, they, they gave us some Latin names to go with. Just add bellum and... Just in below. Anybody take Latin? You guys were all cheated in high school. I took Latin in a public high school. Did someone say I was strange? <laughs> there weren't very many of us in the class, but it was offered. I only went to the school one year, but we took Latin. All right, this basically just ad bellum. That's just reasons to go to war. And then just in bello, we just ways to fight the war once you're actually in the war, the way to prosecute it. This bello and bellam is the same word, just with different endings. Um, if you've taken a, a foreign language, you probably, a lot of foreign languages, the ending of the word tells you what it's used as. So that's all that the um and the o are, different uh, uses of the word. So just ad bellum, just causes for going to war. Just in bello, just ways to prosecute or once you're actually in the war, just ways to fight it. Okay, and we'll uh, we'll look at these two separately. The first thing, but just just add bellum, just ways of going to war, and we've got one through six points there, and then just in bello. My numbering keeps going here. That's not good, but it'd be uh, four points underneath that. All right. First thing here about just causes for going to war. All right, the first one, the war must be for a just cause. There's got to be a just purpose behind the war. (laughs) They're preparing a a piece for uh, PTF. Victory at Sea, so it's a lot of military theme songs, so it's, it's very appropriate. I have to talk to Dr. Fogelman that he's providing the right background music for class. Uh, all right, just cause. It's got to be just cause. Here's the types of things that, uh, that are just included here. Again, I'm not trying to argue for or against this. I think basically this is fine, but these are the types of things that are included in just causes. Things like self-defense. That one I think is very cut and dry. The Mexicans invade California. Wait. Since the Mexicans invaded California. (laughs) An invasion, straight self-defense, that's clear and easy. Assassination could be. Some of the country kills our president. (laughs) Just thinking, do we send bombers or... (laughs) There's some gift cards. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, assassination, that would fit. Uh, attack on national honor, somebody just, uh, you know, burning our flags, attacking our embassy, that, that type of thing. Economic attack can fit. An attack on an ally. Uh, preemptive strikes are considered just causes. What's a preemptive strike? Is that where the teachers' union goes on strike before the strike? Is that... No. <laughs> preemptive strike. 
Bush has criticized some for this. He did this in Iraq. No, I was criticized for that too. But, uh, both of these don't hold any water. Is it kind of like you foresee something would happen, so you take care of it before that? Yes, you, you preempt it. You see something that's getting ready to happen, and you attack to prevent it. You don't have to, if you see your neighbor building nuclear weapons, <laughs> and you know, the, they have the, um, the planes that, that pinpoint with lasers, the targets flying over country, doing these practice runs. You don't have to sit there and wait, well, I can't attack because they haven't done anything. <laughs> you can preemptively attack. Uh, Israel's done this several times with uh, the Arabs in the Middle East attacking uh, nuclear facilities and other things. Uh, Iraq, um, getting rid of Saddam Hussein, all that was a preemptive strike before they could do something. I'm um, sorry, preemptive strikes. Obviously, there's... Um, Anytime that is done, it does open up the way, some questions of, well, was it really justified? And that could be argued, but the basic thought, is, yeah, it is perfectly fine. Um, if Mr. Armacost decided he hated me, and he's I see him out in his yard, you know, building all kinds of heavy machinery and equipment to attack me, and uh, I always think of Luke doing this. He's got a giant, one of those old-fashioned wet stones and he's out there sharpening swords and you know, looking at my house, laughing at us. You know. <laughs> I don't just have to sit there and wait for the attack. At some point, it is justified to preemptively strike before they, they can kill me. So preemptive strike, sometimes that is a little bit controversial, but the basic idea is, is fits and is fine. Um, <clears throat> one other one I'll mention here, because it's part of the philosophy of this, human rights violations. A lot of human rights violations are a bunch of garbage, but, but if there's mass uh, genocide or something, there's, there's evil taking place there, and I could, so anyway, there's, there's some grain of truth to it. So, gotta be for a just cause, that's the first point. If you're going to war because you, um, you, you just like your neighbor's house and you wanna take it, you know, or you, the, the, neighbor's, the neighboring country's got this really rich oil field and you wanna have it, that's not just cause, right? That, that's theft and murder is what that is. So. All right, uh, the second thing. <clears throat> the war must be lawfully declared by a lawful authority. So whatever entity in the government has the responsibility to declare war, <laughs> they have to declare the war, and they have to do it in whatever the law describes it as. It, it, who has this responsibility in America? I think Joy said it. I thought you said it. Yeah, Congress has this. Right? So the president cannot declare war. Right? It's got to be Congress. So if we ever have an actual declaration of war, it's got to go through Congress. If the president did it, or even if the president and the Speaker of the House and the, and the President pro of the Senate get together and make this pact to make a joint declaration of war, that's not the lawful authority. Right? It's got to be declared there. So, so the lawful authority declared lawfully. That's how the declaration of war has to come. The third thing, <clears throat> the intention must be good in the war. <clears throat> you know, basically, you want to address whatever the problem was. Somebody attacked you, you want to drive them out, prevent them from attacking you again, they stole your stuff, you want to get your stuff back. They, they, it can't be that you know, Mexico uh, invades Texas and we respond by, <laughs> uh, properly respond by defending ourselves and then invade Mexico and you know, while we're going, let's go ahead and take Central America. <laughs> you know, we, we, can't, we can't start this war for a good cause and then just turn it into a war of, of conquering and, and amassing territory. The, the intentions, the, the, our goal in a war has got to be good. So, all right, the fourth one. Other ways of resolving the problem should have been tried first. Okay. War should be the last option. Okay. To some liberals, it's never the option. That is not the right answer. There are times where war is the option. But other, other ways should be uh, tried first. Diplomacy, economic sanctions, uh, political pressure from other countries, financial uh, aid, even have listed here, condemnation in the United Nations. Whatever that's worth. <laughs> but other, other ways first. Okay, that, that just like... Um, we talked about when, when are we not obligated to obey the government or 
we shouldn't be looking for the excuse to obey the, disobey the government, nor should we be looking for ways, excuses to go kill people. <laughs> we should really try other ways first, legitimately. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be a long, drawn-out process. So there are times, I mean, uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the, the, all, the other all the other options were instantly exhausted. <laughs> There's one appropriate response. So it's not like this has to be a long, drawn-out thing. Um, but those things should be thought of first. War should not be the first option. Now, in the guy's dorm, um, war is always the first option, perfectly justified. Your, your roommate throws his book in your bed, you know, just take him out. But that's different. That's just between guys in the dorm. All right, so other ways resolve first. All right, the fifth one here, still in just causes for going to war, just ad bellum. There must be a reasonable chance of success. And this one, a reasonable chance of success. At least with a grain of salt. I mean, the basic thought here is suicide missions are not justified. Um, but there are times where I think they would be. Right? <laughs> I mean, really, if, anyway, the, the basic thought I can see, you know, if there's absolutely no way that you're going to win, um, you start the war, it just, you're, you're volunteering to get everybody killed in your country, you know, that, that reasonable chance of success. Um, but I have a little note here, this can sometimes be like the phrase, I didn't make this up, a bully's charter. You know, the, the big countries then can tell the little countries that you, you can't fight me because there's no way you'll win. <laughs> so it, it, this one especially, I have a little bit of a grain of salt on. There are, uh, there are I can see causes and think of uh, examples where even if there's really not any hope of succeeding, you're, not gonna, you're, you're still going to attempt that. So anyway, a little grain of salt, a reasonable chance of success. Yes? Ah, then I'm sorry, United States, more Western culture. Yeah. Yeah. No, Al Qaeda doesn't. ISIS, they don't care about this. <laughs> so, no. They have a much more uh, simplified war theory is that if you're not an active practicing Muslim, as they describe that, you should die. And that's much simpler. <laughs> All right. The last point here, and just ad bellum, just causes for going to war is that the ultimate goal should be to reestablish peace. Again, it's not, not a, uh, uh, you're not created an empire or conquering territories or stealing your neighbor's stuff. Uh, even if you just start fairly, you know, the Japanese attack us and we very justly respond, restoring peace is, is what we want, not, not trying to steal all their stuff. So the ultimate goal should be to reestablish peace. All right, so that is just causes for going to war. If a country is going to start a war, uh, those are the factors involved there to make it just or justified. All right, now just in bellow, once the war started, what's the right way to prosecute it? I still think of um, Donald Rumsfeld when he was Secretary of War, I think. Secretary... Uh, Anyway, he worked for Bush. Um, someone asked him why they were dropping daisy cutters, these, these bombs. I don't exactly know how they work, but they would somehow, before they got to the ground, they would spread out, and it's just like, you know, several football fields of just total destruction. And his response was, we want to kill them. <laughs> the, the, the reporter said, why are you dropping these things? They're very deadly. And he said, yeah, you're right. That's the whole point. You know? <laughs> we want to kill them. So it is refreshing to have somebody actually just give you an honest answer. I don't agree with Trump. I don't, I'm not hoping he wins, but that, that I think is his appeal. Somebody asks him some question like, I said, yeah, I made a lot of money. I was, I was good in business. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, anyway, that, that honest response. So here, uh, just ways to prosecute a war, just in Bella, once the war started. All right, the first point is innocence, innocent people and non-combatants shouldn't be harmed and maybe put in parentheses as much as is reasonably possible. At least they shouldn't be the target. <laughs> Innocent people and non-combatants shouldn't be harmed as much as possible. In modern times, going back to um, 
World War II and a little bit to World War I, <clears throat> we've seen a massive increase in the number of civilian casualties, all right? Um, massive increase. Prior to that, it was just, you know, five or 10 percent of the total deaths were civilian. Uh, now sometimes it's up to 50 percent of the total deaths are civilians. So the nature of warfare, the weaponry and things like that have definitely changed this. But it doesn't change the basic thought that um, the civilians shouldn't be the target. Right? Um, the two examples here. One, if there's an army base that's getting bombed and there's a civilian population nearby, right? the base is a legitimate military target. And if some houses get blown up in the, in the process, and that it's, it's war, right? <laughs> Completely justified to bomb that military base if it's by, in a civilian population area. Uh, the the uh, crazy Muslims in Gaza and other places, um, the terrorists, they like to set up their headquarters in the basement of a hospital or by a school. And then when Israel bombs them, they can go, oh, Israel's killing children. And Israel's, no, they were killing the children. <laughs> Israel's attack on that legitimate target is perfectly justified. Now, if Israel was just bombing the hospital because it was a hospital, that wouldn't be justified. But if they're gonna set up their headquarters and set up rockets that they're launching to Israel in the hospital, it's fair game. Right? So, so that innocents, not combatants, not harmed as much as possible. I, I get so mad at our media, basically every time I watch them, but especially with Israel. We have, we have the, the guys in Gaza and the, and the Golan Heights and other places launching rockets at schools intentionally, and we have Israel launching rockets to blow up where they're launching their rockets from. But Israel's the bad guy. <laughs> the, the crazy Muslims, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're abused. and No, they're sick people. <laughs> sick people. So anyway, the point is, innocent non-combatants should not be harmed uh, as much as possible. <clears throat> Think of um, World War II when we were carpet, carpet, carpet bombing Berlin and other major cities in Germany. Think of the civilian casualties. Okay, it's, it was fine. Think of the, the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Japan. Right, the, the cities that were picked were legitimate military targets. They were uh, industrial areas that were producing military equipment, legitimate targets. Right, so they didn't sit down and think, all right, where's the largest population center? <laughs> Let's blow it up. <laughs> they were wanting to, if Japan decided not to keep fighting, they wanted to cripple their ability to continue producing weapons. Right. We didn't know that they were going to surrender. But anyway, perfectly justified. So no, innocent people, non-combatants, not harmed as much as possible. Again, with modern warfare, it, uh, there are many more civilians that are killed, but that's part of it. Um, <clears throat> and real, um, I've already said this, but uh, other countries use this against us, right? like ISIS and those places. That's why they, they set themselves up in these civilian populations because they you know we are so careful not to do that. Uh, actually, Israel, in, um, it was just three or four years ago, there's another blow up in Gaza and then launching rockets. rockets. Israel would drop leaflets a couple of days beforehand to say, we're gonna, we're gonna blow these guys up. If you wanna leave, this is your chance. And then they would come through it. And obviously that would give the terrorists a little bit of advantage in, to, to get away from them. But they, they bent over backwards not to kill civilians. Um, and then they get criticized. It really is irritating. Um, <clears throat> going back further in history, there's a, an example of a, a war between France and England. And I just lost the name of the battle. Ag at, um, Agincourt? Yeah. Where the British took a whole bunch of uh, uh, French guys captive. And then the, the French lined up like they were going to attack again. So we had the British with all these captives that they had nobody to watch if they had to go back and fight. So they killed all the captives <laughs> and then, then went up to fight. And the French decided not to fight anymore. And even the French said that was pretty stupid. <laughs> we killed all the captives. <laughs> the British were going to hold them as you know, ransom and other things, but they, they didn't have the manpower to watch the captives and make sure they didn't attack them while they were in battle and also fight the French. So anyway, that perfectly justified for them to kill the captives in that situation. So anyway, innocents uh, not killed as much as possible. All right, next one. Uh, only appropriate force should be used. Only appropriate force. Well, 
It's a, it's a good example. China, and they do this. They steal our intellectual property. They pirate all of our movies and things like that. So uh, carpet bombing China with nuclear weapons might be a little bit overboard. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not quite a fair response. Um, so appropriate force, you know, whatever the, <clears throat> it would be based somewhat upon what the offense was, the thing that got the war started. It would be based upon how the other country was continuing the fight. Um, so anyway, appropriate force. The, the nuclear weapons we talked about before, completely justified, um, but other places not necessarily would it be justified uh, to drop nuclear weapons. So any anyway, appropriate force. Um, according to the Geneva Convention, I'm sorry, the Geneva Protocol, there are some weapons that are just inherently evil. All right. Um, land mines are not supposed to be used, chemical and biological weapons and other things. Um, the problem with these stupid conventions is we listen to them. <laughs> Nobody else does. Right? Be like going into a basketball game and agreeing that um, you're only going to shoot three pointers because it's somehow unfair to score points so close to the basket. The other team's going to say thank you. <laughs> They're going to score a lot of layups. <laughs> We're intentionally handicapping ourselves. But anyway, only appropriate force. And there are some uh, UN Geneva conventions restricting and, and banning certain things. So. All right, um, I skipped over a point here someplace. Oh, well, we can put it here. One of the Geneva Conventions is that we can't, uh, we're not allowed to shoot people with anything larger than 50 calibers, 50 caliber, which is, that's not a small gun. <laughs> if you have something larger than that, you can't target people with it. You can only target equipment with it. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're dead from a 50 caliber round or something bigger than that, you're dead. But anyway, I've, I've, I've uh, had, had soldiers actually in this class before who say, yeah, they were told to shoot at buttons and shoot at somebody's belt buckle because you know, that's equipment. <laughs> Can't shoot the person, but you can shoot their equipment. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, there's some, there's some insane things like that that just don't make any sense. Uh, but the basic thought, I think, is appropriate. Why? Why can't Because somehow it's inhumane. <laughs> to target people with weapons bigger than that. We're also not allowed to use hollow points in war. We can't use hollow points, if you know what that is. You have to use full metal jackets. No, it's not good. It's stupid. A hollow point, uh, when it hits somebody, the, the, the bullet is hollow, and it, it mushrooms out and spreads out and does a tremendous amount of damage as it goes through. A full metal jacket stays together and just punches a hole straight through. You're more apt with a solid bullet to be maimed and recover and continue to survive. The other one, it's bad. It's a bad day. What's that? We're not. We can't use the hollow points. Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> Completely insane. Uh, but that, that's the argument. You know, if you've got a full metal jacket, you might shoot somebody in the leg and they'll survive with their leg more likely than a hollow point, which will rip out half the flesh on the leg. <laughs> What's that? That's the whole point. We're trying to kill them. You know, the, the, I don't know what the answer. We want to kill them. <laughs> so. But anyway, <clears throat> appropriate force. There are, like, uh, there are some of these conventions that we've agreed to through the UN that really don't make any sense. And nobody else listens to them other than Western countries. So. All right, we shoot deer with hollow point right? bullets. You know? <laughs> we don't like the deer, though. That's it. All right, uh, two more points. <clears throat> Oh, here's the, anyway, got ahead of myself. Uh, number nine, or, or number three here in just in Bello, uh, after the fighting is over, there should be mercy extended to the defeated. It is not time to, um, once the fighting is over, I'm saying once it's done, uh, in the middle of the fighting, you have captives and things like that. You don't necessarily have to be nice to them. You're at war. You want to you wanna keep them off the battlefield. But once it's over, it's not time to get revenge. It's not time to to kick them when they're down or, what's that? Salt the earth. Salt the earth? Salt the earth. Oh, 
yeah, level the country. <laughs> it's not time for that. So, uh, no acts of cruelty or vengeance, etc., uh, enacted upon them. Uh, we have been very good at this historically. If you think of all the places we've conquered, that we didn't kick them into the ground. Uh, we help rebuild them, we turn them free. We've been very good at that. It really is irritating to hear people talk about American imperialism. All right, it, 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 there's no such thing unless you redefine what imperialism is because we've not done it. So, All right, after the fight is over. And the number 10, this is the point I thought I'd missed. Uh, intentionally, internationally agreed to conventions should be followed. The, the Geneva Convention should be followed. Whatever the international agreements are, they should be followed. If everyone says we're not going to use any gas, poisonous gas in war, then everybody should follow that rule. If we're not going to use chemical weapons, everybody should follow that rule. So if somebody else breaks that rule, can you break it too? <laughs> we just need to nuke them. There's no bans against nuking people. <laughs> so, like I say, those, those things, um, they are dangerous. I mean, they're, they're designed to kill people. They're dangerous. Um, it's war. I mean, it's, it's war. <laughs> so to a certain extent... Um, th those conventions are really stupid, I and mean, it's war. You want to, as quickly as possible, defeat the enemy, and then get on with life. That's... I think it's one to shoot people now. <laughs> so, um, our, our soldiers really are put in some very tight positions um, with all of these restrictions and things like that. I was listening to a, a book on tape, um, called No Easy Day, about one of the guys who was involved with the raid that killed bin Laden. And he was talking about, you know, kind of going through his whole life in the, in the seals. And he got to one particular house. Uh, there were, you know, they, a whole group of them took over a compound where they knew there were some fighters, some, some Iraqi, or um, it was in Iraq in Baghdad. Um, so they, they all had houses they had to clear, and he'd get into his house, and he finds this guy sitting in the corner, and just far enough away from him that he couldn't shoot him. This is AK-47 and grenade launcher and stuff like that. But the rules that he was supposed to follow were that if, if the weapons were a certain distance away, they weren't considered a threat and you couldn't shoot them. And that guy knew that. <laughs> so he has them just far enough away so that he can't get shot. All right, so we, we put some of these crazy rules on our own soldiers that, you know, there's, there, we don't want our soldiers like... like like John told the soldier, do, do violence to no man. We don't want them out just indiscriminately killing people, but they're at war, right? And uh, that guy knew if he didn't get shot, he would get arrested, they would question him and things like that, and then a few days later, they would have to release him. If he was in that room with his AK-47 and our Navy still came around the door, it would have been an ugly day for him. So. So he didn't do that. So anyway, we, some of those rules are really, really dumb, and we, we, are, we tie the hands of our soldiers. They do an extremely good job of doing that, and it's really aggravating to hear people that sit in nice soft chairs in Congress talking about these soldiers who are facing stuff like that, and maybe sometimes he shoots the guy, and the rifle's two inches too far away, and they want to prosecute him as a war criminal. I mean, that, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> so... So anyway, there's some, these, these restrictions are, in a lot of cases, really, really idiotic. Um, so enough said. Just causes for going to war.